welcome back to our second session today. And this will be our expert session. And we are going to start with uh, watching the video for which you had a link on the brief. Uh, it's a video from the Philosopher's YouTube on gender. And uh, you will see that in the documents you were sent by email, there was a, a shortened version of statements both from the expert paper and from the YouTube video, um, which, will, which you will hear again listening to the video. We are going to listen to the video and then we are going to have some groups uh, divided by uh, stakeholders. So students will meet together, teachers will meet together and staff will meet together. But for now, I invite you to sit back and enjoy the video. you need to know about gender is that it's not the same as sex. If you want to go into that distinction, Marina Shut Up has a great video on it, but the TLDR, sex comes from biology, although that does not mean that it's a binary or clearly understood, and gender is... more. Gender is a state of being, a mode of life, and what exactly that more is, we shall investigate. One of the most famous theories of gender, and where it comes from, is Judith Butler's gender performativism. You may have heard of it. It's the idea that gender is something we perform. It is the stylized repetition of acts through time. Now, some people have taken gender performativism to mean that you can perform whatever gender you like, and that ultimately your gender is a means of self-expression. But interestingly, that's not actually what Butler meant by it. It's not a performance in the way that an actor chooses to perform a role and reads from a script and dresses themselves up. It's performance like performativism, which is a technical term. Let me explain. Some ways of speaking are performative. They don't just communicate something, they also constitute an act. Like for instance, if you say guilty during your trial, you're not just communicating that you did it, you're also actually instigating a legal process and a whole bunch of other stuff happens as a result of you doing that. Or for instance, saying I do at your wedding, or an umpire saying that's out in tennis. Yes, the speaker is communicating, but they're also performing an action. Butler thinks that one of the things performative speech can do is constitute an identity. The repeated stylized actions that make up your gender aren't an expression of some hidden self. They are the self. She says, Gender performativity is not a matter of choosing which gender one will be today. Performativity is a matter of reiterating or repeating the norms through which one is constituted. Another very important thing that Butler emphasizes is that your gender identity is not constructed by you. The repeated stylized actions that make up your gender are taught to you and enforced. When a baby is born, she says, a performance of it's a boy or it's a girl happens, and the baby can be expected to perform very differently depending on what that assigned identity is. In her famous book of feminist existentialism, Le Deuxième Sex, Simone de Beauvoir emphasizes at great length that those who are gendered male are often expected to maintain very different identities from those gendered female. Just to be clear, Butler is not denying that sexual differences exist. What she's interested in is how some physical differences between people come to acquire such significance, and other physical differences, like hair colour or eye colour, don't so much. But hang on a minute, I hear some of you saying, are you telling me that all those people on Tumblr who say that their gender identity is something I've never even freaking heard of, are you telling me they're actually correct? Well, yeah. Kind of. Your gender identity is not an expression of anything in yourself, according to Butler. It is yourself, so there's not really any grounds for saying that somebody's doing their gender wrong. In fact, as new social systems are created online, it's perhaps not surprising that we see some gender identities emerging that under different systems would be interpreted differently or actively sidelined. It's actually a point in Butler's favor that as new social systems emerge, we see new gender performances emerging with it. There are two big theories about what gender is and where it comes from. 
Gender essentialism says that whatever it is to be a gender is ultimately best explained by biology. Sex chromosomes, usually. Social constructivism, on the other hand, says, surprise, surprise, that your gender is socially constructed. If you're very clever, you might have noticed a parallel to the similar debate about what race is, which we've talked about on this channel before. Butler's performativism plays very much to the social constructivist angle, because she thinks that gender identities and all of the expectations and rules that come with them are grounded in social norms. Julia Serrano says that gender performativism is in danger of being a little bit patronizing. It's in danger of overlooking the fact that for a great many people, their gender expression is what feels right for them. It is, in a way, an expression of something inside them. Serrano thinks that both essentialism and social constructivism are incomplete. She thinks that people acting against what essentialism says their gender should be, based on their sex chromosomes, occurs far more frequently than the essentialist can account for. The essentialist will say that people with exceptional gender expressions come down to genetic anomalies, but as a geneticist, Serrano thinks they occur far too frequently in the population for that to be true. But at the same time, she says, people with exceptional gender expressions often display them from an early age, supposedly before any kind of social conditioning could have set in. So maybe the social constructivist is missing something as well. The missing ingredient, she thinks, is what she calls subconscious sex, which is how your brain expects your body to be. She thinks trans people can be acutely aware that their subconscious sex does not match their physical body, and therefore the identity that they were assigned on the basis of that body. Whereas cis people have a subconscious sex that does match their physical body, and therefore they don't experience that very painful gender dissonance. Whilst she does think that subconscious sex is a matter of how your brain is wired, she doesn't want to go full gender essentialist on it, because she does think that social conditioning can play a huge role in how you interpret your subconscious Conscious sex. What she's really trying to explain is what she's found as a trans woman, which is that certain kinds of gender expression just feel right. And that feeling right, she says, is a function both of your subconscious sex and the social construction of gendered identities. So as an alternative, she puts forward the intrinsic inclination model. According to this theory, you are intrinsically inclined to some of the kinds of behaviours that make up your gender. If we take gender, which is a spectrum, and graph it against physical sex, which is also a spectrum, we get two overlapping bell curves, just like if we graph height against physical sex. And just like with height, there are certain correlations that we can observe. People with penises tend to be taller and tend to have certain kinds of gender inclinations. But just like with any set of overlapping bell curves, there are outlying cases. The difference between this and the gender essentialist model is that whereas the essentialist would say that the outlying cases are down to genetic errors or anomalies, the intrinsic inclination theorists can say that they're just examples of perfectly normal variation within the human species. Serrano thinks the chief advantage of this model is that it explains both why there are typical cases, most people are in the middle of the bell curves and most people are therefore cis, but also why there are some rarer but still perfectly normal cases. I think Serrano's theory is compatible with Butler's gender performativism. The subconscious sex needn't be a complete self that exists prior to being assigned a gendered identity. It could just be, as she says, natural variation in the kind of gendered selves that feel right. What all this gets at is that, perhaps worryingly, your identity as a gendered being may not be up to you. Serrano thinks that your brain can, and definitely should be allowed to, play a role in shaping your gender. But she, Butler, and de Beauvoir all emphasise that gender is as much object as it is subject. An object that is shaped and acted on by other people, as well as you. What do you think? What is gender? Is performativism on the money? What's your experience as a performer and beer of your gender? Leave me a comment telling me what you think, and for more philosophical videos from me, don't forget to subscribe. This episode, as well as the two that I did on Kant, was filmed in YouTube Space London as part of YouTube's Next Up Creator Camp, so I want to say a massive thank you to all the staff who've helped me move these huge lights and cameras and microphones from studio to studio on this, which has been a very long day of filming. Well, oh, thank you to our philosopher. And uh, now we are going to continue in breakout groups with 
Jesus and Constanza working with students, Megan and Carolina working with teachers, and Anna working with administrators and leadership team. And we are going to explore several questions um, which refer back to this video. And we're, our first question is really in discussing different gender theories, think about your life and work study environment. Which of the two principal points of view do you recognize as being most relevant for you? Gender essentialism or gender constructivism? Why? Could you give some practical examples? And then the second question goes more into detail with Judith Butler's concept of performativity and examples that we were provided with in the video. Can you provide examples of speaking that don't just communicate something, but which also constitute an act? So these questions, your, your moderators will reiterate these questions and they will be in your chat, but we will um, be coming back together in 20 minutes to hear from Cecilia for her presentation of the expert paper. Welcome back everybody. And we hope that this has been um, an interesting conversation for each of you. And um, we will be asking our moderators to share uh, what you discussed and we will bring that back to our conversation before the end of the day. But for now, I will be introducing our expert speaker and uh, suggesting that, um, that you consider taking some notes on her presentation, um, because then you will be in smaller uh, groups with just three other people, and we will be asking you some questions. Um, and one other comment, we, we've had a, a remark from one of the participants uh, suggesting something that's totally true, and that is that these theories, in fact, have much broader implications than those that have perhaps been discussed in the philosopher video. And uh, we want to just be clear that the whole field of gender studies is a huge field, and it's an emerging field, um, but that in this particular uh, uh, project, we're we're trying to make sure that everybody is, uh, is aware of the same principal concepts and that we use these principal concepts to develop policy recommendations for our sector. It doesn't mean that these other aspects of, of, of these theories aren't important, but we, we haven't been able to address them all. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce to you our expert today, Cecilia Fern Almqvist, and I'm trying to pronounce it correctly, but I don't have the right intonation. So please excuse me for that. So Cecilia, the floor is yours for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to get with, with my colleague, Anne Werner, who is not able to be here today, uh, that we got the opportunity to write this uh, paper and to not least to discuss with you because uh, this is a uh, theme that we are really engaged in. And uh, I am a professor in education at Södertörn University, but uh, I'm also a professor in music education and I've been work working mostly in the up, uh, up north in Sweden, at, in Piteå at the School of Music there, but also in, at four other conservatories in, in Sweden. And Anne Werner, she is professor, associate professor in gender studies, but she is also active in uh, music, musicology. So, and um, uh, this paper that we have been writing for this occasion is um, uh, taking up the question of what is gender, and there can be some overlaps with, with the movie you just saw. Uh, when, but then we go into gender and relation to music, and then even closer to music in higher education and gender. 
uh, and they're also professional roles, how they are gendered in the music, um, higher music education. Uh, and um, therefrom we also go into intersectionality with, that is connected to, to gender issues and um, sexual harassment, sex myths and other kinds of harassment connected to, to gender. And finally, we say something about what become the task of teachers and also leaders and maybe students in higher education to, to um, um, create an uh, equal, equal education. So, an everyday defini definition of gender simply states that there are two genders, male and female that are biologically different and treated differently in culture and society. During second wave feminism in the 1960s and 1970s, this way of defining gender was widely challenged by feminist theorists arguing that gender roles are created in socialization and that sex one is born with does not determine the social gender one inhabits in society. This feminist critique problematizes that some roles and works, such as raising children, are best done by women. Also, the oppression of women in culture and society was challenged by scholars discussing how gender power operated uh, through, for example, the socialist feminist theory about the structure of patriarchy. Patriarchy was a concept introduced to explain how social systems reproduce male power when men holding political leadership, privilege in social settings, and owning most material assets in society, a condition that can still be said to be accurate. Feminist theory has since grown to be a vibrant field that focuses on how femininities and masculinities, as well as gender identity, outside the binary one man woman take form are treated and changing in culture and society. Importantly, Judith Butler that was also mentioned in the movie was one of the theories that problematized the division between gender and sex, arguing that there is nothing before gender. Rather sex gender is constructed performatively as we already heard of. By seeing gender as performative, she argued that gender is processually created in all speech and actions, never a finished product. In her way of understanding gender, the construction of gender always involves the construction of heterosexuality. That is, for Butler, a person is not fully understood as a woman if she is not heterosexual, because heterosexual relationships are central to how we understand male and female opposites. Butler uses the norm, the, the concept norm to illustrate was <clears throat> how dominating ideas about who is a woman or a man have material consequences that affects how persons are able to live their lives, get work, be accepted in society, etc. Lately, Butler has in public debate in public debate argued that gender is changing in the 2020s and uh, that we can see a change in the category woman being more inclusive for lesbian or trans woman. Also, the binary idea of society consisting of men and women have been challenged by activists for intersex people and persons that are non-binary, neither men nor women. In current feminist research, the importance of social and symbolic ideals for the construction of gender is widely agreed upon. Still, there are also many scholars that acknowledge and discuss the importance of bodies, materiality, and difference for gender in contemporary cultures. So what about gender and music then? Policy documents on international and European level state that music shall be accessible to all, independent of any factors that may be discriminatory or unfair. But this has not, in fact, been achieved, as we well know. It has been stated that traditional gender structures are produced and reproduced in professional musical life, and that the music community has an overrepresentation of men within popular music musicians work is clearly segregated. 
The singer position is seen as belonging to women, while instruments are occupied by male musicians on an overarching level. Not least the role of the electric guitarist and the music producer are male dominated. Singing and especially singing in high register is associated with women or gay men. Depending on the cultural, historical and musical context with men sing, singing can also be regarded as an act of masculine behavior. For example, in the rock, rap, jazz, popular music industry, as well as in opera and musical comedy. Earlier research suggests that when men sing, they often obtain appreciation for singing performances. On the other hand, when girls choose and male connected instruments, they tend to be praised for being sexy or good looking instead of being treated as skilled instrumentalists. In Western art music, musicians work is also divided by gender. Women are primarily employed as singers, violinists, flutists, and happy sport players, while men work as composers, conductors, bass players, percussionists, and brass players. French horn, cello, clarinet, and piano, on the other hand, can seem to be occupied by both genders. This gender division influences the makeup of teaching staff in higher music education institutions. In fact, music, what genders and styles are deemed to be valuable and feminine in Western art music culture has been found to be gender. So what about gender in mus higher music education then? Music education practices are to a great extent steered by norms around gender, music genres, and other forms of society and cultures. For example, whose ideas are deeming, deemed as interesting, what is valued as musical skillness, who can develop as a musician, and how musical knowledge should be performed are all values created in relation to norms. Research on music education and gender shows that music teaching and learning also is an area where gender is shaped. This is the displayed in choice of instrument and genre, the possibility to claim space, power relations and subordination from gender perspective. Such norms are reproduced by musicians who teach in higher music education and are educated within the institutions where they have been taught by others, also educated there. Within higher music education, te teaching is often formed in the master apprentice tradition, where students are expected to imitate and become their teachers. As Gaunt expresses it, the model on imitation is seen as contributing detailed musical and technical expertise to be developed and refined almost as it were by physical and mental osmosis. Such a view can also reproduce gender the teacher has to provide, has the power to decide what to play and how it should be interpreted. It has been found that students of different genders are treated differently by their masters, and that music education promotes male students or females who accept male influences, values, and ways of behaving in teaching situations. It has been shown that gender pluralized view of musical genres is common in music educational settings. This affects who is suitable to play certain instruments or certain genres. Also, when it comes to what students learn, studies show that white male students develop musical content and expertise. Female students tend to focus on the musical whole instead of their own parts, being concerned about practical things around musical situations, helping others jumping in to complement missing parts in the whole production to a greater extent than male students. Again, on an overarching general level. Caring for the whole responds to gender norms, according to which women take more social responsibility. Below, we underline the risk that such expectation negatively impact on careers for women in higher music education. Educational relations in higher music education take place in interactions between teacher and student and in interaction between students. It has been emphasized that gender related behavior, agreed upon norms, imaginations and expectations, as well as use of language, limit music students in the educational situation. 
it has been shown to be important and music students get opportunities to affect how they realize their ideas and use the musical space to transgress such gender stereotypes. When discussing gender and higher music education, it also becomes relevant to shed light on interplay between music education, gender, power, teaching and research positions. The number of women on all academic level is increasing and most undergraduate students are women. While inequality remains, it is more on a subtle level than before. For example, men are still holding more prestige positions, a fact that cannot only be explained by age, discipline and generation. In addition, women in academia do a lot more so-called glue work to keep things running at the department. However, there are some characteristics of higher arts education that differ from other academic disciplines. For example, there are criteria for assessing quality, especially of artistic works, are relatively unclear, making assessments diverse. When it comes to promotions to higher academic positions, studies shows that experts rank men with the same merits higher than women, of some reason. Quality remains gendered, which underlines the need for explicit criteria of quality in the performing arts. A recent study performed in Scandinavia problematizes construction of expertise and excellence within music education in relation to gender and position with high status. The author underlines the double subordination of female professors in music education at conservatoires compared to male professors in artistic disciplines. She shows that music education is positioned as peripheral and feminine. The discipline is called into question by players from other disciplines, musical performance and musicology, for example, not seldom by male artistic professors. The interviewees express that gender inequality is a struggle and an everyday problem. On paper, I'm a professor, but at my department, I am positioned as a woman, woman working in pedagogy. They think research on young children is not a value and you become positioned even more as a woman. The example illustrates that gender inequality exists between professors and disciplines in higher music education and that having female professors does not solve gender inequality. When scholars have examined the importance of gender in higher music education, gender has increasingly been problematized as a category that can be examined on its own. Feminist politics and feminist theory has been challenged for building on a universal idea about women. The problem of such a unified subject, unifying all women's experiences, is that focusing on what unifies women obscures other social categorizations that divide them. Feminist theory and politics have been called out as promoting a woman that is really pseudo universal, mirroring interests of certain groups of women white, middle class, ethnic minority, heterosexual, and able bodied women. An intersectional theoretical understanding of gender, class, and race was introduced by Green Show around 1990 to explain how gender, class, and race interact in structural oppression of Black women in the US. Green Show argues that structural intersectionality can be used to understand how power dimensions interact, how oppressions of race, class, and gender make conditions and experiences different for women from different social and racial groups. Oppression, she argues, is not double, but plays out differently depending on gender, class, and race. Further, political intersectionality is a strategy introduced by her that requires addressing several oppressions at the same time, for example, sexism, racism, and capitalism. It is, according to her, not enough to challenge gender oppression of other power imbalances uh, if they are not also counted. In higher music education institutions, as in higher education in general, sexism, racism, capitalism, homophobia, and the treatment of trans people should be seen as interacting, for example, in teaching. This paper has focused on gender in higher music education but from an intersectional theoretical perspective, 
addressing gender inequality also involves addressing race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, and other power imbalances in higher music education. And then some words about harassment. One pressing issue in higher music education that is also a gender issue is sexist treatment and sexual harassment of students and staff. Sexual harassment in the workplace has been discussed in feminist theory and political theory for decades, defined as unwanted sexual attention that ranges from unwanted compliments or touching to rape. Sexual harassment survivors are mostly women and the perpetrators are mostly men. Informal power structures, institutions that build their working and teaching methods on supervision where one person holds great power or others careers have been identified as risk factors for sexual harassment. In higher music education, the one-to-one -one tuition teaching and the master apprentice tradition makes it easy for sexual harassment to occur in closed rooms. It is, however, not just these situations, but the larger context of a very competitive field where a small group of people hold great power over a large group future that is breeding ground for culture of silence around sexism and sexual harassment. A culture of silence is a workplace culture where people are afraid to speak up about injustices they see related to power in fear of losing their jobs or positions. To challenge sexism and sexual harassment, the gender power patterns in higher music education must be addressed. So what to do then? One task for higher music education, including leaders, organizers and teachers, is to move past gender inequality and transform music education. To promote equal possibilities to study music on a professional level for all students, independent of gender, class and race. A critique of neoliberalism in higher education and at the intersectional take on gender and power are essential to tackle gender inequalities in higher music education. To transform higher music education, we need to be aware of what space for development can be created within the legal frames and have ideas about how to use that. The invisible norms and structures related to gender and power have to be made visible by the institutions of higher music education for change to take place. Working as towards gender equality in higher music education should be done in line with legislation, policies and steering documents, as well as in conversation with faculty and students. When it comes to faculty, it is important to see all disciplines, subjects and instruments as equally important and to have the same expectations of all professors and teachers, independent of gender. In the teaching situation, it is important to be aware about what the teacher has to relate to, what to take responsibility for, and what to do in ways that encourage equal possibilities to learn and develop for all genders. It is important for teacher to be informed on students' experiences and holdings in relation to the teaching content which can, as we have seen, be connected to gender. Students' motives for choice of instruments, experiences of role models, relations to shoes and genders in a context, the impetus for development and experience power relations all affect the learning. To get such insights demands openness and curiosity in dialogue with the students. As a teacher or leader in higher music education, one should take responsibility for steering, teaching and educational organization towards equal possibilities. For example, possibilities for women to study double bass can be encouraged, which also open up for reflections upon who, how teachers can challenge structures that hinder such possibilities. In addition, openness for the students' motivation, ideas, musical preferences, impetus, lust and personality, as well as the local institution and situation should be considered. Teachers must, take, must ask students what goals they have, what they want to discover and develop, and how they as teachers can contribute to that. One prerequisite for such actions is motivation among higher music education leaders with the power to transform. 
collegial discussions about gender equality, which we are having here today in high music education is one way to illuminate what norms a specific institution are steered by. This discussion can lead to practically grounded policies using insights and knowledge about how students can be viewed and approached equally. It's also crucial to highlight what frames are possible to influence, how the educational environment can be improved, what gender equality goals are set for a specific activity or semester, and what consequences for gender equality specific educational approaches have. These topics can be consciously developed in discussions involving faculty, leadership, and students, exactly at, as we have today. Very much, Cecilia. Thank and, you. Um, now we are going to um, break out into pairs, and we are asking you to very briefly list for yourself three sentences from the expert paper and presentation that really stood out for you. So these can be um, uh, aspects that relate to harassment, that uh, uh, relate to gender norms, to uh, relate to gendering of professional roles, whatever feels most important to you from the presentation. And then we would ask that you formulate one question for Cecilia. And in your uh, duo, we would ask that you share this with your partner and we will come, in, come back together at 1245 and share in the chat box your questions with Cecilia for the last, um, the last 15 minutes. So um, Barbara has uh, got you going into little pairs and you will each highlight three key sentences or concepts that you would like to, uh, that you considered important and then formulate one question for Cecilia. Thank you. So thank you everybody. And um, I hope that you had a, a fruitful exchange with your partner. Um, and I would like to invite those of you who have specific questions to uh, write them in the chat so that we can ask Cecilia directly. Um, but while we wait for these questions to arrive from the chat, um, I would like to ask Cecilia what you would suggest in terms of change for primary and secondary education uh, to reduce gendered roles as, as they pertain to music. Um, because we know that this question, it, it arrives already fully baked you know, in higher education, but what do, what do we need to do at an earlier level? Yes, uh, I mean, I think we have to, to contribute to change at, at all levels because we are involved in a recycling wheel in, in a way that people that, that work with the small children is also educated at uh, conservatoires or schools of music and uh, uh, it goes around, so to speak. But uh, of course, um, it is, I mean, the more aware people that work in early childhood and in, in uh, lower years in schools, the more aware the teachers are, uh, the, I mean, the, the larger is the chance that the children can develop in the way they want or to whatever they want, not hindered by gender perceptions or gender expectations and so on. And uh, of course, uh, in turn, we must have an aware education of these preschool teachers as well. So they are aware of what traditions that steer their behaviors and their uh, approaches to children's, their expectations and so on. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's so easy that we fall into traditional ways of um, approaching children when we work with music, what we expect that girls rather sing than playing the drum, for example. Um, and that is not, I mean, in unaware ways, in unconscious ways. So awareness and uh, seeing children as human beings in the first case and not as genders or sexes. Uh, that is 
really important, I think. Thank you. So we have a couple of other questions that have come in, come in here. And um, one question is, how can vocabulary be changed in classes without losing respect for everyone? Um, well, it's a uh, question of vocabulary. I mean, really, yeah, how can we... Yeah, I, I mean that uh, vocabularies are, are really important. Um, uh, but I don't know why, I mean, the connection to respect, uh, I don't really understand, could that be developed? Um, what is, what respect is connected to the vocabulary? Well, I, I, I shared the question, but maybe we're going to just keep moving because we have several other questions. Yeah, um, but uh, I mean, uh, I will just underline that, uh, that the language we use is really important not to avoid conserving uh, gender uh, patterns, of course. Um, there's been a question asked about uh, the master-student relationship. Um, could you expand uh, a little bit about that and, and, and suggest what that implies, wh how, you, how you see this as being important? Yeah, <clears throat> there are many, many... Uh many levels of that, uh, I think many aspects. I mean, um, the master is expected to be imitated uh, in one way, uh, that is one aspect. Uh, and uh, there can be preconceptions of how you should behave in, in relation to, to gender. Um, and also that some role models uh, might uh, not might are missing, uh, but but also uh, the most important thing is, is the power relation. I suppose or I think um, that is connected to uh, possibilities to uh, uh, getting um, um, tasks or jobs or uh, um, get the chance to to play or sing in, in, a, in a professional location or in a, 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 an important occasion. And um, that there is a risk that you don't, uh, I, I mean, if you see gender in the first case and not the qualities and, the, um, and what the students are actually able to, what they want, what they, are their impetuses, um, that can be a, a risk, I think, connected to that. Yes, thank you. So we actually have two questions that have come in around a similar issue, which is the question of how we develop policies and environments that are respectful uh, in our institutions. And um, what would you consider to be the, the, the most important first steps um, so there, one question was, should we do it all at once or should we take little steps? And then there's another question which says, what are the first steps we need to take? So maybe we can, we can approach the question in that way and say, what might be our first steps um, in trying to change the, the work environment? Uh, I guess, Sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, to uh, uh, what you do now is <laughs> a really important first step to discuss and uh, put things on the table, to be aware of one, one's own values um, and um, expectations, um, and then start to discuss, do we have, uh, do our students have equal possibilities? Where do we see uh, inequality and uh, what hinders equal, equal pathways through the education and how can those hinders be limited? So um, um, I think to, to see reality as it is, uh, is the first step and then uh, agree upon goals. How would we uh, want our reality what would we like it to look like? And how do we come there? What hinders are there and how can they be limited? That's, that's great because it ties right in with uh, an exercise we're going to do later in the day about dreaming uh, mm. what 
like to see in our reality. Mm. Mm. Um, so um, here's another question that has to do with the question of gender and age. Um, so this is, you know, maybe this is a, a stereotype, but are older teachers more difficult to reach when it comes to reflecting on gender and teaching? And do you believe that younger people will, will refresh the landscape and, and, and bring a change of attitude or, or is there something just more global that has to take place? Um, uh, I, on a general level, uh, it, it could be that younger people are more uh, reflected upon those things because they are, uh, there have been a greater openness and uh, openness for varied genders, gender types and so on. And also that uh, it's more, um, uh, to some extent, more um, expected that students also, uh, I mean, uh, have have a voice and are to be heard and also younger colleagues are expected to have an opinion and, and be able to reflect and so on. But I think there are the, the traditions uh, within conservatories and also music education, educa music education at lower levels, the traditions are so strong. So it's very easy that you get socialized into those behaviors um, and that you are also expected to behave in specific ways and uh, grade students in specific ways and uh, uh, have an opinion of what to be played in what ways, in specific ways, as we have all, always been doing this way and so on. So uh, I, I think that it won't change uh, by itself. It, it needs aware uh, strategies to change because otherwise the, the recycling wheel will, will just continue and uh, strong strengthen itself because we are all involved in that recycling wheel and some things are just taken for granted. So, um, um, yes, so I think, yeah. you know, this, this idea of stepping out of the wheel is a wonderful image. And just one last question, which um, maybe you can respond quickly since we're running out of time. Um, this is a question that has to do with uh, the experience of, of competition within, uh, for example, among, amongst women instrumentalists, would they feel a lot of pre pre pressure to compete against each other, given the kinds of um, uh, experiences they, they, uh, they, they feel uh, as women or the, ex the uh, discrimination they may suffer as women? Does this mean that they then again compete more with each other or does that do you think that that comes into play or not yeah i, I think uh, based on uh, recent studies uh, i am and Anne are, are making that that can be rather different between instrument groups oh. in, in some uh, uh, departments or some uh, traditions there is more of competition than in others um, and um, I, I think that there also needs a really aware, uh, it needs awareness among teachers and leaders to see those differences and to, to really loosen up in, in some, uh, some uh, genres, so not genres, but instrument connected practices. Mm -hmm. And um, the male gaze, we haven't mentioned that in the paper, but that women often feel that it's important to be, uh, uh, that they feel this male gaze, that it's important to show skills uh, uh, to other musicians that are male to be confirmed in a way. Uh, so that can also contribute uh, the competition be between uh, women also. Um, but um, it's a co complicated area because, uh, I mean, there is also competition between teachers that they will have uh, the best students that also influence how the behaviors regarding to competitions and audiences and so on, if, they, if the students are encouraged to, to support each other or to be more individualistic and, uh, uh, and compete uh, in a traditional way. So um, well, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, you know, you've, um, you've given us a lot of food for thought and, and certainly um, I take away from this the idea that um, the kinds of policies that we hope that this project will engender um, will take time and that they start by the very conversations that this group is engaging in on smaller in smaller groups and in larger groups and um, and that's not something that happens overnight and that it's a very complex you know enormous uh, area that goes from uh, childhood and and social and social norming to uh, higher music education, to the industry, and, and how we, we look at this as a continuum, continuum and be aware and encourage uh, discussion and uh, dialogue in all these instances is, is a tall task. But we are very encouraged by everything that you have shared with us and your examples. And um, we, we will look forward to sharing the results of our work with you um, when we come to the end of these assemblies. Yeah, so, great. For, so for the members of our um, uh, assembly here, we will be coming back together after lunch at two o'clock and we will dream the future and we will look at the realities also. And um, in this way, we will continue to um, broaden our understanding uh, of, of what these very complex concepts are. So Cecilia, my um, thanks on behalf of all of us here in the uh, assembly, in the assembly working group. And thank you to all of you who have participated and shared your questions and your thoughts. I think we've had uh, enormous uh, feedback and wonderful uh, sharing uh, all morning. And we look forward to uh, doing so again for our third session of the day at 2 p.m. So um, have a good lunch and we'll see you back here in about one hour.